Wonderful. Thank you, Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, thanks for the invitation to talk. Some familiar faces and some fresh ones. Hello. My name's Seb. I'm the Managing Director of Player Research, uh, based here in Brighton, over, uh, down on Queen's Road. I think I was invited to speak at one of these events about six years ago, so I'm glad I didn't disgrace myself or say anything too controversial that I wasn't invited back. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, yeah, you've had six years to do a new presentation. That's so true, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's too late, you'll be seeing uh, repeats again. No, it's nice and fresh for you. Um, quick bit about player research. We do playtesting, user research, and put players in front of unfinished video games to help make improvements to their design. It's our 11th anniversary this year, on January the 4th, so uh, one more time around the sun. And yeah, managing director. So I help uh, both run the business of 20 people in Brighton and Montreal, and I'm a game dev consultant too, so I help studios use player data, player psychology, and player feedback. Uh, the theme of the event, although you didn't mention it, so I don't know, maybe I'm off on one now, it was Developers Unite, or bringing developers together to learn things from each other. Good job you're here, isn't it? I know, <laughs> what can I say? Uh, so I thought about that a little bit, what would I like to cover with regards to um, bringing de development learnings together, what have we learned from across all the games that we've worked on, hundreds of games in the last 11 years. And one of the design challenges that keeps coming up over and over for us and being brought to play research is about teaching players to play about helping them learn the rules and get into the games quickly and effectively so they can enjoy the fun that you're ideating. Uh, so I thought I'd share something from the very many games we've worked on. I'll set the scene a little bit more. Development teams are producing these wonderful worlds, these wonderful dynamic rule sets, engaging stories and nuanced characters, deep systems of gameplay. But all of these studios will eventually find themselves up against the difficult challenge of getting that information from their game design into the heads of the players, so that the players can enjoy it and learn. And it's essential. Players aren't likely to enjoy something that they can't understand. They have to get the rules before they can play the game. And it's core to the fun of many of the game, games like these and genres like these, uh, it's the fun is delivered by players going through that journey of understanding, of learning how to play. In fact, play itself in some ways, if you listen to the theories, is about learning and applying those uh, learnings in practice. Right? This is the, 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 the so in order to unlock all of this fun, and there's a lot of it, there's some great games here, um, I feel it's essential to be really deliberate about how we teach players to play. When we're designing these games, teams coming together, being really deliberate about how they're going to communicate all of these rules and all of these stories. And of course, I'm biased because I'm a researcher, testing that process too. Getting players in front of these unfinished games, testing our assumptions and hypotheses about what players are going to understand and making changes to the design as we go. So we have to be deliberate about what we tell players. But we've also got to be deliberate about what we don't tell players. Games have to tread this really fine line of wanting to have friction, which is to say something that's tough, but also be, in other ways, frictionless and be easy to use. They want to do both those things. They also, games want to be intuitive, which is to say players can pick them up and play and they can be approachable, but also be surprising and have novelty in them. Again, these are paradoxes of each other. And a core desire of games is often to be easy to learn, just to say quick and you know, intuitive and everything like that, but also hard to master, so easy and difficult out. Again, these are paradoxical in some way. So, and, and these are all about whether we tell players things or whether we don't. And again, we have to be deliberate about whether we tell players information or withhold it from them, for them to work out by themselves or for them to find through mastery. If we don't be deliberate, we risk tipping the balance on these things too far or not enough. Of course, video games have this perhaps unique uh, tool in the toolbox of interactive tutorials. Here are, here are two. I, I googled what are the worst tutorials ever and I found Mario and Luigi Dream Team, which is apparently exceptionally patronising by telling you what these things are, and uh, Far Cry Blood Dragon, which tells you that you should uh, press enter to make these annoying patronising screens go away. But, uh, you know, uh, memes aside, 
uh, video games have this incredible tool of an interactive portion of the start of the product that teaches you how to play. Uh, but not many other products have this. In fact, I dare say uh, that you don't read through the manual of that brand new appliance you got for Christmas or what have you. Read through the manual thoroughly before tearing off the plastic of the product and plugging it in. But none of us do that, right? Uh, and tutorials are the same. Players don't necessarily want to engage with content like this. And I don't think I need to convince you that this idea of front-loading all of the information that we want to tell players, a lot, often with text, is a particularly effective way. It's not an effective way to teach people anything in the same way that lectures at school aren't the best way that people learn. They're too long. They try and share too much. They're decontextualised from the experience. They talk in jargon. I could go on. So, OK, I've set the scene. We've got to be deliberate we've got about how we do it. We've got to be deliberate about what we communicate to players. And we really don't want it to be front-loaded in a boring tutorial idea. So I help teams with challenges like this. Unpacking situations where players don't get it. And what I want to share tonight is a relatively simple theoretical model. All right, I know, it sounds like a lot. But it's just a simple way of thinking about teaching and learning that I hope can be useful in game design, in conversation, in thinking about uh, the robustness of the thing that we're making. All right. I posit that there are three strategies that players have to learn how to play. The first of those in, uh, is explanation. This is a plan to tell the player exactly what they need to know. As if you're handing them a treasure map with all of the instructions upon it. Typically through exposition in a tutorial pop-up. The aim of the game is to text. With exact instructions. If the game design could speak, it would say, I will tell you that, or I expect to tell you that. So I've covered this tutorial stuff. Second approach. You're expecting players already know how things work. It might be information they recall from other games with similar rules. They have experience with things in real life. If you hand someone an axe and point them at a tree, they know what to do. You do not have to explain something to some player. That's to someone. Lastly then, experimentation. You're expecting players to search for clues and experiment to work things out for themselves. It doesn't necessarily have to make sense, but they'll work it out. For example, uh, you'll, have, you'll build in clues into the product for players to work out where the treasure might be buried. Now, these three strategies are sort of atomic from each other, and they're very different. They've got different risks. I've already talked about some of the risks of having too much explanation, but there's perhaps risks associated with these two. And so I'll do a few minutes on just talking about those. Let's imagine all of those three strategies inside a triangle, or on the outside of a triangle. Everything inside this triangle is stuff that you, as a design team, can control. This is, this is a pop-ups and tutorials, and there's clues, and there's hints, and there's feedback. Everything is on the inside. And there's also external sources. Now, I don't have time enough to talk about this, but if a friend tells a friend how to play, or you're watching Twitch, and they, some streamer uses some incredible strategy that you've never seen before, like this ways in the real world we can learn about games that we don't have control over. I don't have time to cover those, although I could definitely do an hour on it. Uh, so we'll, we'll keep the things inside of our control for now. Okay, uh, back one. So with this idea of three distinct strategies, I would love you to imagine yourself asking in the process of designing a game or having a conversation with your team, which of these could we use to communicate the thing we're trying to design? Which of these strategies, exclusive strategies, could we use to teach the thing that we're trying to design? All right. Let's quickly do an example. No, no, I'm running a bit out of time, so I'll, I'll go a bit faster. Let's zoom in on the idea of explaining something through explanation. Uh, we, ch we might choose to tell the player, if our objective is the player should learn that they are throwing knives for medium-range silent assassinations, we could lean into explanation in our design saying, exactly what players should do there. You found a blade, throw it at your enemies. They won't hear you. Press R3 to throw. Cool. I don't have to explain that. It's intuitive. If we were to rely on leaning more into explanation, 
uh, sorry, expectations, we would say, what if that knife, instead of being this shape, was this shape? Players might be able to intuit that they could throw it. They understand and recognize this shape from pop culture, and that they can intuit what they might have to do with it without me having to tell them. So, you know, we've already reduced some of that friction. Fantastic. And we might also shift the mapping of the button onto something that's assassinate or throw in similar games. Right? So, we, again, we've moved it closer to players' expectations. And lastly, if we were relying on exploration, we might have the player taught how to throw stones first, and then they find or craft a throwing knife. And they would make it into it or explore themselves, that capability. Or we might be really deliberate in showing the player character's model holding the knife by the blade instead of by the handle. It would help them intuit that this is possible. Now, I can hear already this, the results. This feels like this is really basic. And these are obvious responses to the idea of this learning objective once we've set it. But I hope that this process of laying out these three spectrum of options will diversify your thinking in the things you can do to help teach players things effectively without relying always on sticking a new tutorial prompt on the screen. So it's an ideation tool. All right. I'm going to quickly whiz through some of the design patterns that fit under each of these things. And I think you already know, having a, a, all gamers, I'm sure, played a zillion tutorials and worked out what it's like to be told things by text and exposition. So I'm going to skip over those for a second. These two are maybe the more nuanced and more unusual or more difficult, certainly, to design of the two, of the three, I should say. And so I'll just briefly spend a minute on these. If we decided to lean into our expectations, try and make a game that feels familiar and approachable, of course, we're going to look to the platform and genre standards. X to jump, LT to aim down sights. It's common also for games to stick to everyday mental models. For example, gold, silver, bronze for first, second, and third. Players can recognize those from real life and apply those, that knowledge and learning to the game environment. I don't have to teach you what that looks like. And lastly, thinking about external consistency, which is to say, Anything we can make more consistent with the real world. Players learn things from their environments, and they learn things from life, and so if we can make our games more consistent with that, I don't have to tell you that an axe hits a tree and gets wood. You can just intuit that. And lastly, on exploration, thinking less about external consistency, which is consistency with our world, but more about internal consistency, which is to say the game is consistent with itself. An attack that shines red is always unable to be parried. Something in the game that is gold will always restore your health. This is nothing to do with the real world. That's, those are both absolutely nonsense, but there is internal consistency to the game that helps players explore and learn those rules. Uh, we've also got error handling, so if players do things wrong, helping them correct that, and thinking about breadcrumbing, around where we're putting players' attention. In games that can often be barren and uninteractive, Driving players' attention to the one thing that they can learn about is a core tool in our toolbox. All right. I want to be really clear in saying that none of these teaching strategies inherently make the game any more fun or less fun. There are long games with long tutorials that are amazing. There are games with short tutorials that are amazing. There are games with no tutorials that are amazing. I think there's fun to be found for different kinds of players all over this the strategies that are output of this mental model. But what is true in my experience is that each of these different strategies leads to radically different experiences. That these are different games if they choose to teach themselves in different ways. And that some of them perhaps are more desirable for your pillars of your title than others. And so I hope, it's my hope at least, that this mental model will be helpful in diversifying your thinking about how to teach players things. And at the very least, games that consider, I think, all three of these strategies will be much more effective generally at getting the player to the fun. Okay, so I hope this model is useful to you. You're welcome. Have it. Think about it. Let me know if it's useful. Uh, tweet, tweet me on Twitter if you think it's great or awful. Um, and as I say, I really hope it improves the breadth of thinking uh, about teaching players so that you're not defaulting to adding more to the tutorial. Thanks. Thank you.
you seem to have this barrier here. I know um, you said that your company's been around for a while, which is 11 good. Years. 11 years. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing an improvement from companies when they come to you know, in terms of what they put as an introduction? Unquestionably, sort of unquestionably so. I think you know, if we, at the start, of the, the start of the business all those years ago, if we'd have said for 2E or first time user experience, I would have probably got blank stares. If I'd have said UX, I might have got blank stares. I think there's an in, in, incredible maturation around the player experience that's come from um, the accessibility of titles, approachability of titles, especially mobile and the increasing costs of entry for video games that's brought huge audiences that demand this kind of uh, onboarding. These audiences don't necessarily have strong expectations or existing knowledge about video games, and so they you know, the focus on getting those players into the product effectively and making the most of their first few minutes has you know, it's been paramount for the industry. And so, yes, I think so. But I'd still love to see more confidence in reducing tutorialization yeah. as a tool. I just, if games, don't, they don't necessarily need it, but we do have to be more thoughtful yeah. about how it's going to be done. Wonderful, thank you. Any questions from the floor for Seb? In that case, you can stick around afterwards. I so certainly if you want to come and have a chat with Seb afterwards, he'll be here for a while. So thank you very much once again.